right, here is a quick review of the, uh, for the final exam, spring 2020. Here it is. These are the topics that I've picked for the exam, and I hope you study all this carefully. All right, let's go. So, first of all, we have Carnot's engine, which is a heat engine, of course. The heat engine takes heat from the source, converts a part of that into work, and rejects the remaining to the sink. And the processes by which this happens, it's four processes. AB is an isothermal expansion. BC is an adiabatic expansion. CD is an isothermal compression. And DA is an adiabatic compression. So there are two isothermals and two adiabatics involved, all right? Two expansions, two compressions. That's Carnot's engine. And the useful work done in Carnot's engine is given by the area of A, B, C, D. Now to the efficiency. If QH is the heat absorbed and QC is the heat rejected, H for hot, C for cold, and the temperatures are TH and TC, then the efficiency can be written in many ways, mainly three formulas. Efficiency is work done over QH, but work is QH minus QC, see? QH minus QC, so that makes it QH minus QC over QH. Or efficiency can also be written as TH minus TC over TH. Also remember that the maximum efficiency of Carnot's engine is 100% or 1 in this case. And that happens when TC, TC is absolute zero, which again is the idea for the Kelvin scale of temperature, where there cannot be negative temperatures because if TC is negative, two negatives make a positive and then E would be more than 1 or 100%, which is impossible. So the lowest temperature that can be reached is absolute zero. All right, so that's number one. Next, we have work done during an expansion of a gas. And here we're looking at uh, work done at constant pressure. The small work done is given by PdV but the total work done is pressure multiplied by change in volume, okay? So V1 is the initial volume, V2 is the final volume. You just multiply the pressure with the change in volume, but pressure's got to be in pascals, and volume has got to be in meter cube. Now, it'll help to know that a thousand liters is one meter cube, okay? So here's an example. Let's say the pressure is 100 kilopascals and the volume goes from 20 liters to 60 liters. So 100 kilopascals is 100 times 1,000 in pascals. That makes it five zeros, so that's 10 to the power 5, as you can see, 10 to the power 5, multiplied by 60 minus 20. And then I've divided by 1,000. Oh, that's supposed to be divided by 1,000. So when you divide by 1,000, let's see if I can write that in. I should be able to. So if that's 1,000, then it's uh, 30 times 10 to the 5. That's 30 times. So 3 times 10 to the 6 divided by 3. So 3 times 10 to the 3. So let me change this to 3 times 10 to the 3. So that would be correct. And I'm, I'm glad that I caught that. 3 times 10 to the 3 joules is the work done. So that's how we do that, okay? So that's the second one. And number 3, what is that? Oh, density. Density is mass over volume. Remember that the density of a substance is a constant. So if you take a small quantity of water or a big quantity of water, the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. So density does not change when the volume of the substance, provided it's the same substance, if you take that substance, the density doesn't change. And here's an example. If you have a, 
and a material whose length, width and height are given. You see the length, width and height, all three in centimeters. And uh, you multiply all three to get the volume in centimeter cube. And if the mass of this material is given as 50 grams, then density is mass divided by volume, which gives you 50 divided by 20 centimeter cube. So that is 2.5 gram per centimeter cube. Also remember that in kilogram per meter cube, this will be just times a thousand. So it will be 2.5 times thousand, which is 2.5, I mean 2,500 kilogram per meter cube. So that's how you do the density thing. All right, so that's next. Specific heat. Okay, specific heat is a constant for a particular material. And it helps us to calculate how much heat the material requires uh, to be heated through a certain range of temperature. And that formula is MC delta T. So M is the mass, C is the specific heat, and delta T is the change in temperature, correct? Here is an example. So the mass is 200 grams, which you have to change into kilograms. Divide by 1000, you get 0.2 kilograms. The specific heat is 4186, that's for water. Let's say the initial temperature is 20 and the final temperature is 60, both in Celsius. So the quantity of heat required to do that would be 0.2, which is the mass in kilograms times specific heat times change in temperature, which is 60 minus 20. When you multiply all those, you would get the answer in joules, 33,488 joules is the heat required in this case. So that's a way in which you could use specific heat. Now that can be used either to find the heat added to a substance or the heat removed from a substance. It works both ways. Okay, next, what do we have here? All right, so same idea, you can mix a hot substance with a cold substance and then in that case, the hot one loses heat and the cold one gains heat. And of course, the heat lost by the hot would be equal to the heat gained by the cold. Now, remember the formula that we had before, we can apply that to both. So I'm using H for hot and uh, think I'm using C for cold. So heat lost is MH, CH, TIH minus TF. <clears throat> Excuse me. TIH is the initial temperature of the hot. TF is the final. Now the final temperature will be the same for both because the hot one cools to that temperature and the cold one heats up to that temperature. So TF is the same. But remember that you always got to take higher minus lower. So, you know, the initial temperature of the hot one is bigger, so that's there. But on the cold side, you know, it's heating up. So the final temperature is going to be bigger than the initial. So that's why it's backwards here. And an example, so if you take the mass of the hot one as 0.2 kilogram, let's say it's... a uh, Specific heat is 385, and then it goes from 90, it goes from 90 to TF. The cold one has a mass one kilogram, and it's water again, so it's 4,186. That's a specific heat multiplied by TF minus 20. So carefully multiply these two numbers, and I get 77, and then 90 minus TF. And this one is, of course, 4,186 multiplied by TF minus 20. And next we got to distribute this, so 77 times 90 will give you that number, 6930 minus 70 TF. Again, do the same here, 4186 times TF minus 4186 times 20, which gives you a big number. So that is what? That is 83720. Now collect the TF terms to one side, so this will become positive and goes to the other side. Bring this to the other side, that becomes positive. So you add these two and then add these two numbers, right, on the other side. 
So that will give us a sum total just coming up. So on the right side I get 90650 and on the left side I get 4256 TF. Now divide both sides by 4256 and you will get TF as that number divided by 4,256 which gives uh, 21.3 degrees Celsius. You notice that the change in temperature is just a small bit because water has a big specific heat. So that's the next one. It shows how to mix hot and cold and find their final temperature. All right, next one, conduction. Heat is conducted usually in solids and the rate of conduction, Q by T, is given by Ka Th minus Tc by D. Okay. K is the constant, which is called thermal conductivity. A is the area of cross-section, like the area of this part, see? Area of cross-section, which would be normally pi r squared because it's circular. D is the length of the rod or the thickness. Like if you're talking about heat coming in through the walls in summer into the room, you know. So D would then be the thickness of the walls. TH would be the outside temperature. Let's take it as 50 degrees Celsius in summer. Inside you want to keep the AC running at 20 degrees Celsius. You're keeping the temperature constant at that. Let the area of one of the walls be two meters squared. This is not the entire home, just a part of the wall. And K for brick is 0.8. You see the unit watt per meter per Kelvin. And then Q by T, which is the rate of conduction of heat. That means heat conducted in one second. Remember that. Heat conducted in one second is uh, given by that. When you substitute into that formula and calculate, you would get um, 4,800 joules per second. And that's called watts. So 4,800 watts. So if you were asked to calculate the heat that comes in in one hour, all you got to do is multiply this quantity with 3,600 seconds because one hour has 3,600 seconds, okay? Just remember this is the quantity of heat being conducted in one second. All right, next up you have buoyant force. So it's whenever you put a solid in a liquid, the liquid pushes up. That's called the buoyant force. And the buoyant force is equal to the weight of that liquid or fluid displaced. And what is weight? Weight is mass times gravity. And mass is volume times density. So that's how you get that formula. So to find the buoyant force, always find the weight of fluid displaced which is given by volume of the fluid times density of the fluid times acceleration due to gravity. But if the whole solid is immersed, then the volume of the solid will be equal to the volume of the fluid. So as an example, suppose there is a solid, that's a big solid, because its volume is 2 meter cube, okay? That's immersed into water, density 1000 kilogram per meter cube, G, you know, is 9.8 meter per second squared. So let's find out the buoyant force. So when you multiply those numbers, you get 19600 newtons. So that is the buoyant force. So if you're asked to calculate the apparent weight, like how much it weighs in water, which is going to be less than its actual weight, then you got to go the real weight minus the buoyant force, okay? So assuming that the real weight is 30,000 newtons, I'm just assuming, then the apparent weight in this case would be 30,000 minus 19,600, which is 10,400 newtons. So that's how you find the buoyant force. Remember, it's a review, so I'm going fast, but you can stop and listen. All right, need to keep going. Next one is how do you change from Celsius to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to Celsius? There are two formulas, quite simple. To change from Celsius to Fahrenheit, you go 9 by 5C plus 32. But remember, 
you first do 9 by 5 times C and then add 32. That's when you're going from Celsius to Fahrenheit. But if you're going from Fahrenheit to Celsius, it's, uh, it's going to be a little tricky here. It's going to be 5 by 9, but it's F minus 32 in parenthesis. So that means you got to first subtract the 32 from the F and then multiply. Okay, here's an example. Suppose F is 212, then what you got to do is substitute into that. So first you take 212 minus 32, which gives you 180. And then 180 times 9 by 5 gives you 100, 100 degrees Celsius. So 212 Fahrenheit is 100 degrees Celsius. Bam, we got that. So that's one. And then the next one. The next one is talking about latent heat. Latent heat is when there is a phase change. So it's the heat required to change one kilogram of ice into water. Okay, that's called the latent heat of fusion. Or maybe one kilogram of water into steam. That's the latent heat of vaporization. And either of these two cases, the formula for quantity of heat is mass times the latent heat. Okay, so sometimes you would have a combination problem like you have a piece of ice and you got to first melt it and then you got to heat the water to a certain temperature. Okay, so let's say you have 10 grams of ice. So you got to first melt it and then change the temperature of the water to I don't know what I picked, let's see, at, okay, to 20 degrees Celsius. So that is two steps. First, you calculate the quantity of heat required for the first process, which is melting. And the formula used would be Q is equal to mass times latent heat, right? Okay. Mass is uh, 10 grams. Uh, Got to change into kilograms. 10 by 1,000 will give you 0 0.01. And then you will be given the latent heat of ice, 336,000. So when you do that, you get 3,360 joules for process one. Next, the ice is just melted to water at zero degrees Celsius. And now the water has to be heated from zero degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. And what is the formula for that? It's MC delta T, because that is not just uh, ordinary heating. And again, the mass is 0 0.01. The specific heat of water is 4186. And the change in temperature is 20 minus 0 because it goes from 0 to 20. You do that, you get 837.2 joules. Add the two and you will get the total quantity of heat required as 4197.2 joules. So that's how you do that. The amount of heat radiated by an object depends on emissivity, where you compare it with a black object. So it depends on a constant called Stefan's constant. It depends on the temperature of this object, which has to be in Kelvin. It's always safe to have all temperatures in Kelvin. So it depends on the emissivity it depends on the surface area. Now that's the area of the surface because it's the surface that radiates heat, right? And then you have the constant and then this is the temperature of the object, T is, and T naught is the temperature of the surroundings, okay? If there is no mention of the surrounding temperatures, just, just take it as zero Kelvin. So that's the surrounding temperature. So let's do an example because here you have raised to the power four, you need to be careful, which means if you double the uh, temperature of an object, it radiates 16 times more. If you triple it, it radiates three raised to four times. So that'll be 81 times more, okay? So keep that in mind. Here's the question. I'm assuming that emissivity is 0.8, area is 0.05, that's the sigma value. And then the, the object is at 300 Kelvin and the surrounding is at 290, okay? So the way you do it is you first find out this carefully, all right? And then multiply with the other three. Do not forget there is 10 to the negative eight. So you will get 2.34 joule per second, which is watts. 
So that's how you calculate the amount of heat radiated by an object. All right, coming up, you have the gas equation. PV is equal to nRT. That's the ideal gas equation. Pressure in pascals, volume in meter cube, N is the number of moles, R is a constant. It's called the gas constant. T, of course, temperature in Kelvin. And uh, you also remember that one mole, uh, this is important, one mole of any gas at STP has a volume of 22.4 liters. One mole of any gas at STP. What is STP? Standard temperature and pressure which means the temperature is 273 and the pressure is 180 m. So if you take any gas and keep it at 273 Kelvin and uh, 180 m, I mean you should take one mole of that gas. It will all have 22.4 liters, okay? So that is a fact that you have to know. Because if you know that, then I can ask you to find the volume at nether temperature and pressure, see? which I'm going to do now. So let me speed this up. One mole of gas at STP occupies 22.4 liters. And let's say the new temperature is 20 degrees Celsius and the new pressure is half an atmosphere, okay? 0.5 atm. So what is the new volume? So again, you go make volume the subject from here. So P will go to the denominator. And then it's, uh, we're talking about one mole of the gas. But if the question says three moles, use three, okay, whatever is there. And then you have R, which is the constant here. You have 8.314. Temperature is assumed to be 20. 20 Celsius is 293 Kelvin. And pressure has to be in Pascals. So one ATM is 101325 Pascals. One ATM. So you divide that by two because the new pressure is half an ATM, okay? And when you do that calculation, you get that many meter cube. It's okay to leave it in meter cube. It's okay. But if you multiply that with a thousand, you will get it in liters. So just for comparison's sake. So that means at STP, it occupied 22.4, but at... Uh, this new temperature and pressure, it occupies 12 liters. And next Obviously. you have pressure itself. Pressure is defined as force by area. Force divided by area. But pressure by a liquid is H rho G. Okay, H rho G. And when you come to this, you got to be careful. H rho G is called the gauge pressure. So like if you're measuring the uh, tire pressure using a, a gauge, what you get will not be the total pressure. You will get the gauge pressure, which is how much it is over and above the atmospheric pressure. So if you want the total pressure, which is called the absolute pressure, you got to add the atmospheric pressure to the gauge pressure. Add the atmospheric pressure to the gauge pressure and you get that. See? So remember that. So if you're asked to calculate the gauge pressure, just use H rho G. Don't even worry about the atmospheric pressure. But if you're asked to calculate the absolute pressure, first calculate the gauge pressure and then add 101325, which is the atmospheric pressure. Okay? So H rho G is what? It is the gauge pressure. Usually you're asked to calculate H rho G. That's it. H is the height of the liquid, rho is the density of the liquid, and of course G is acceleration due to gravity. So as an example, if the height is 50 meters and uh, the density, that of water, fresh water, is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube, what is the gauge pressure? Okay, gauge pressure is H rho G, as simple as that. So you would go multiply the height of the liquid, which is 50, with the density times 9.8. That shouldn't be tough at all. And you would get the answer in Pascals. Okay, so 50 times 1,000 times 9.8 meter per second squared, you would get it, you would get the answer in Pascals. So 490,000 Pascals is what you get, 490,000 Pascals, all right? 
The next one is uh, we're into oscillations. Simple pendulum, right? Simple pendulum where you have a string and a mass attached and pull it to one side, it oscillates. The time period of this pendulum depends on the length of the pendulum and the acceleration to gravity. So it's 2 pi square root L by G. And uh, if you assume the length of the pendulum to be one meter and take the value of G, we can calculate the time period. And we will get the time period is very close to two seconds. Two seconds. Okay, remember that the time period depends on the acceleration due to gravity. So if you take it to another planet, uh, the time period will change. Okay, will change because it's dependent on the acceleration due to gravity. So if the acceleration due to gravity goes down, the time period goes up. Okay, just, just remember that. I uh, think we are on to the last one, which is, again, an oscillation, oscillation of springs. Two ideas here. Number one, if you apply force on the spring, it stretches by delta x, and this is the relation between the applied force and how much it stretches. K is a constant. It's called the spring constant. So you could, uh, you could be given a mass uh, attached to the end of the spring, you know, it's the weight that's the actual force, mg. So you could put that and find k. And then after you get k, you will be asked to find, or you may be asked to find the time period oscillation. Here is the formula for time period. And this is for a light spring. So we're not considering the mass of the spring, assuming it to be negligible compared to the attached mass. Okay, so here is the example. So assume that we attached 100 grams and uh, those 100 grams cost an extension of 0.1 meter. 100 grams in kilograms is 0.1. And then so I found the value of K first. And after you get the value of K, we can find the time period assuming that is the same mass attached, you know. So it's 0.1 divided by K, which I got is 9.8 you get the time period as 0 0.635 seconds. So those are the topics on the final exam. I hope you just run through this, go deeper, you know, and try to study everything about these topics and you will do good on the exam. All right, good luck and see you on the final exam.